Hello, bonjour, and welcome to another edition of JSL TV. I am your host, my name is Joel, and in this video, we're going to be discussing this day in history. When I'm talking about this day, I'm talking about November the 17th, way back in 1993, because on this particular date, it will go down as a day in infamy. At the time, a very dark day in the history of French soccer, but one that laid the foundation for a bit of a dynasty years and years later. This date, November the 17th, 1993, was the date when France was eliminated from the 1994 FIFA World Cup in the most heartbreaking of fashions. We're going to give you guys a bit of storyline behind what went into this match, what happened during this match, and sort of the aftermath of everything from this very big, big match between France and Bulgaria with a spot in the 1994 World Cup in the United States on the line. So the storyline for the French was very simple. For the French, all they needed to do was pick up one point from this match. All they needed was a win or a draw, and they would assure their place in USA 94. They were playing in front of their home fans at the Parc des Princes. They had some outstanding generational talent around that time, people that were being recruited from some of the top leagues in Europe. I'm thinking about guys like Marcel de Sailly, who was a rock at center back for the French at that time. Laurent Blanc was a starter for that particular team. Didier Deschamps, of course now the French manager. He was a mainstay with the French national team. They were managed by Gérard Houllier. They also had a certain Aimé Jacquet who we'll get to and who is becoming very well known with French people nowadays. Uh, there was Bernard Lama in the goal. The uh, Ligue 1 champions at the time were Olympique de Marseille who had just won the European Cup, the Champions League. The first and only team in France to capture that tournament up until this day even. So there was a lot going on for the French national team. There was Eric Cantona as well, of course, who was a mainstay with Manchester United, making quite the name for himself over there. There was David Ginola, who was getting a lot of interest from clubs in England and overseas. He was featuring at PSG. There was Emmanuel Petit, the Monaco midfielder at the time. Of course, many Premier League players will know that name nowadays for what he went on to do later on. On the opposite side of things, Bulgaria, well, they had quite the team as well. They had a good generation at that time. It was, of course, led by the great Risto Stoichkov, easily, in my opinion, the greatest player to ever play for the Bulgarian national team. He was coming fresh off a victory at the European Cup just a couple of years ago in 1992 with FC Barcelona under the tutelage of Johan Cruyff. Of course, there was also Krasimir Balakov. There was their goalkeeper, Boris Mikhailov, who was featuring for uh, Mulhouse in France at that time. There was Emil Kostadinov, who uh, we'll get to him in a moment because he is a very prominent player for the Bulgarians, not only in this particular match, but in uh, the future of Bulgarian football as well. He was one of the last great, great strikers in addition to Risto Stoichkov. There was also Jordan Lechkov, who goes on to play in French soccer later on in Ligue 1. We'll get to all of that. Now, that's the context. So the job is simple for both teams, really. Bulgaria needs to win. Bulgaria needs a win. Otherwise, they are not making it to the United States. France needs at least a draw in order to get through. France had missed the World Cup in 1990. Uh, Michel Platini had come in, had built a bit of a resurgent French team heading into the 1992 Euros, but then they did not perform all that well at the Euros. They crashed out in the group stage. However, there were uh, the pieces were there, I feel like, for the French team to do something really special under the guidance of Gérard Houllier. So we're going to talk through the game now and what was on the line. Also should mention the French missed their chance to qualify for the World Cup in their previous match before this deciding match against Bulgaria. They lost that to Israel in spectacular fashion. They had a two-goal lead. They let that slip away in the final 10 minutes or so of that game. So they needed another result, whether it be a draw or a win in this game. Now let's talk you through all the things that transpired for this match. 
So as we take a look at the French lineup here, you'll notice a lot of familiar faces. Bernard Lama, who went on to be the reserve keeper for their 98 team. Laurent Blanc is in there, their former manager years later. Marcel Desailly, Emmanuel Petit. You see Lisa Razou there on the bench. Yuri Jorkaev, Ginola. We're going to talk about Ginola, the late Bruno Martini as well. Gerard Ullier, of course, Liverpool fans will remember him years later. So the atmosphere is electric. The French are feeling very confident confident about themselves. We get a shot at Jean-Pierre Papin, who was the captain of the French national team at that point. Uh, so the French got to be feeling pretty confident. Bulgaria, it has to be said, have a very good lineup themselves. Boris Mikhailov, their goalkeeper, features at Mulhouse. Balakov becomes a big name. Penev, Risto Stoichkov, of course, won the uh, European Cup, now known as the Champions League, with Barcelona at that time. So Bulgaria had their share of talent as well. Um, so we start the game off. First off, there is your typical little antics, which we see a lot of time at uh, French national team games, especially back in those days, the famous rooster. They're going to chase that off the field here in a second, as soon as they get festivities underway here. So... Things are just a nice little thing there to get rid of the tension, I suppose, because there was a lot at stake at this particular game. Obviously, Bulgaria needs a win to make it in. They had not made a World Cup for quite some time. The French missed qualifying for the 1990 World Cup uh, under Henri Michel. Michel Platini took over midway through. Then he was in charge of the team that crashed out at the group stage of the Euros. So we get things underway here. There's a nice tackle by Didier Deschamps, who would later become the captain of the team. There is a nice little counter here by the French. Good ball into the box. That's a great flick on by, that was Papin, right into the path of Eric Cantona. And you thinking to yourself, okay, France are on the right path. France are doing what they need to do. Things are on the right foot for the French national team. The crowd is into it and things seem to be going up to par. So now all they need is a draw, remember. So they have already got a one goal lead. So they're in pretty good shape. Now here come the Bulgarians. This was only a few minutes later. There is Balakov there. There's Kostadinov. We'll talk about him. There's Risto Stoichkov in the box. A good delivery. Good header. No chance for Lama uh, on the post there. Pedros can't do anything about it either. Ullier a little bit distraught. So if we fast forward now into the second half, Jean-Pierre Papin leaves his place for David Ginola. France is still tied, still qualified for the World Cup. And now let's talk through this. Free kick for the French. 20 seconds to play. Ginola, for some reason, tries to make a cross there rather than take it to the corner flag. We'll break this down in slow motion in a little bit. Here comes Bulgaria on the counterattack. Lots of space be being given to the Bulgarians. There's two French people. Can't close them down. They get the ball up. That's Kostadinov from a very acute angle. He roofs it beyond Bernard Lama. Now, when you look at that play... David Ginola got a lot of criticism for that, for not doing the smart play at that time. There was next to no injury time back in those days in the early 90s. Uh, so Ginola, the smart thing to do, obviously, would be to take it to the corner flag, try to kill some more clock, force somebody to foul you, or at the very least, in all likelihood, it's going to end up either as a corner kick, or if it takes a carom off you, then it's going to be a goal kick. But at the very least, you have some time to set up. But I'm going to break it down for you guys in a different way. I'm going to show you how it wasn't all David Ginola's fault. They needed a scapegoat and Ginola was the scapegoat for that. But let me talk this through you guys and let you know exactly who's at fault. Because in my opinion, there's a lot of people that deserve some blame for how this goal happened for the Bulgarians late in this match. There is Aimé Jacquet, can't believe it. Ullier goes back to the bench. Kostadinov obviously overjoyed with the situation. There's some disbelief from the French. There's Marcel Desailly. He can't believe it. Michel Platini. That look says it all. Look at this play again. There's Deschamps. Really no challenge whatsoever. Easily lets it get up the field. There's Pedros on the left and on the right is Petit. Again, they took really their sweet time. Roche lets the ball go through way too easily. Misjudges it. And look at the angle from Kostadinov as well. Okay. Roche misses the tackle there. He mistimes his challenge. Blanc is late with that challenge coming in to try to block it and the goal goes in 
on the near post for Bernard Lama. So realistically speaking, is Ginola the only one that deserves blame for that? Could he have not made a cross and avoided that and killed some more time? Yeah, of course he could have. But realistically speaking, is Ginola the sole person to blame for that particular instance? No, I don't think he is. We saw a half-hearted challenge next to none for Didier Deschamps on that restart. We saw two French players in the middle of the field, Pedros and Petit, being too slow to close those guys down. They all went to sleep. They all forgot that the match was still going on, that the referee hadn't blown the final whistle yet. We see Roche misjudging his eyes. He's looking towards the guy delivering the ball as opposed to Kostadinov, and he just missed times his challenge a little bit. Lama gets beat on the near post. You cannot allow that when you're a goalkeeper. And Laurent Blanc as well is a step or two a little bit too late coming in to make that challenge. So a lot of people to blame on that particular situation. Now, of course, afterwards, Ginola became the scapegoat, goat, and a lot of it was because of his manager at the time, Gérard Houllier, who did not have a lot of kind words to say for David Ginola after that particular play. Um, they said things like the adventure is over all too soon with only 30 seconds remaining. This was words from Gérard Houllier essentially throwing David Ginola under the bus for this particular play. Ginola would essentially go and sue uh, Gérard Houllier years later for throwing him under the bus like this in an unnecessary fashion. But anyways, that was kind of the beginning of the end to some players on the French team. And for some of them, it would lay the foundation to some other things. So let's go through the aftermath of that particular haunting day if you're a French football fan. Now, Let's start with the Bulgarians first. The Bulgarians would go on to play in the 1994 World Cup. They would have by far their best tournament ever. They made it all the way to the final four. Risto Stoichkov was the leading goal scorer. Jordan Lechkov would go on to play for Olympique de Marseille years later. Kostadinov would go on to play in Spain for Deportivo La Coruña. He would also go on to play uh, for Bayern Munich, helping them to the UEFA Cup, now known as the Europa League. Kostadinov, one of his last goals for the Bulgarian national team, would come four years later in a 6-1 drubbing when they lost to Spain in their final game. In fact, that was their last World Cup appearance. Now, even though Bulgaria made it to the World Cup, and you'd think, okay, that's great, great exposure for the Bulgarians, how many Bulgarian players can you name who made it to the same status as Risto Stoichkov? I can think of maybe one. I can think of Dimitar Berbatov, who went uh, played in the Premier League for a while, who also played for Monaco. There aren't that many great Bulgarian players that I don't think a lot of people could think of off the top of their head since then. So that was kind of the 94 World Cup was the beginning of the end of sort of a golden generation in Bulgarian football. But... What was heartbreak at the time for the French team built sort of the foundation for winning, built a lot of character within a lot of those guys. Of course, there was Dussailly who would go on to win the World Cup for France. Laurent Blanc would go on to win the World Cup for France. Bernard Lama was the reserve goalkeeper at that time. There were some people who were left off of the French team and wouldn't play again following that particular uh Failure at the World Cup. Uh, Jean-Pierre Papin played a little bit during the 96 qualifiers, but wasn't a part of the team from Euro 96 onward. Uh, Lama was more of a reserve after the 1996 Euro. He ceded his place to Fabien Barthez. They took... Eric Cantona off the team in controversial fashion. A lot of people were questioning why Aimé Jacquet would do that going into the 96 Euros. There was... David Ginola, who was also left off the team at that particular time. So some high-profile players who were not playing for the French team, and that drew a lot of criticism from magazines like L'Equipe, among others. Now, the players that would go in, the generational talent that would come in at that time, would transcend French football and really set a mark that we have not seen in quite a while from uh, the French national team. Of course, they would go on to host the World Cup in 1998. They would bring on the likes of Zinedine Zidane, of Yuri Jorkaev, who was on the bench for that particular team. He was a big part of the French team who went on to win the Euro in 2000. He had a disappointing 98 World Cup, but he was still a starter for the French national team. They brought in Christian Carambeau. There was also... Um, Lilian Thuram, we didn't talk about. He was a big player for the French team 
following that tournament from basically Euro 96 on. He is now uh, the most capped player in the history of French football. So at the time, clearly was not too amazing of a feeling, was not too pleasant to think about the fact that there was not going to be France taking part in that World Cup in the United States. But look at what the French were able to do ever since then. They won the World Cup in 1998, their very first World Cup. They won the Euro right after that, the first team to win the uh, Euro after winning the World Cup. Uh, they produced so many great talents shortly after that particular failure. Thierry Henry came into the team. He's now the all-time leading goal scorer. David Trezeguet is in the top 10 in terms of all-time leading goal scorers. Lilian Thuram, I just mentioned. Fabien Barthez. So many great group of groups of talented players for the French national team that would go on. So a heartbreaking moment at the time, a black day, a day that realistically speaking should never have happened in the history of French football. But it was one of those moments that you look back on and you say, okay, that we are never going to let that happen again. And with the exception of their collapse, I would call it, against the Swiss at the Euros, it has barely ever happened again. They were on lockdown in 98 whenever they had the lead. And they have been a lot better playing with the lead. And not only that, they have done their job when it comes to making the World Cup. Maybe one time it was a bit of a controversial thing when they didn't deserve to make it in the 2010 World Cup. But for the most part, the French have gotten it done when it comes to qualification. So what do you guys think? Who is at fault for uh, years and years later for that goal, for that debacle in that game against Bulgaria? Is Ginola the only person to blame or was he just used as a scapegoat in your opinion? What about Gérard Houllier? Was he right to throw his player under the bus like that? Do you believe that a coach has the right to do that to one of his own players? in a match like that when they make an error like that. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section. Like and subscribe to this video. Share it with other people. And of course, check out more quality French content in the future.